The word instruct and educate are both related to the learning process. Instruct means to build in. Obstruction, construction, instruct means to build in. Educate means exactly the opposite. It means to draw out. Some of us are old enough to remember Benito Mussolini, who was the leader of the Italian people. They called him El Duce, the leader, the guy that leads you out. So today we're going to have an educational experience. I will probably not tell you anything you do not know, but hopefully we will stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance and it will be educational. Our text is from 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read a couple of verses before and after. We'll start with 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22. Now you have been purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart for you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk so that it so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. The quotation from Isaiah chapter 40, I think, will prob would probably remind these believers of John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. This is 6 through 8, so the sections are seen together in when Jesus was on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Jewish people knew that was from the 22nd Psalm. And in the 22nd Psalm, we find details about the crucifixion that are not even in the New Testament scriptures. For example, that's the only place it is specifically stated that the feet of Jesus were pierced. We assume from the Gospels that they were pierced. Behold my hands and my feet. But the 22nd Psalm specifically states that the feet. So it's very important to associate with the text, the context. So anyhow, um, Peter's going to be talking about an eternal kingdom. And John the Baptist came preaching, repent, the kingdom of God's at hand. Repent, the kingdom of God's at hand. And the kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. Nicodemus came to Jesus and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you can't even see the kingdom here born again. You've got to have a totally different perspective and you can't enter into it unless you're born of the water and of the spirit. Nicodemus said, how can a man do that? Can you enter second? Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel. You don't understand that. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So don't marvel that I say to you, you have to be born again. It is elementary that every seed reproduces after its own kind. Genesis 1, 11, third day, God made living things and every living thing had a seed and every seed reproduced after its own kind. So Nicodemus, if you want spiritual life, you have to have a spiritual birth, spiritual seed. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Nicodemus you are in a physical family because the seed of your father was planted in the earthly womb of your mother and that combination produced life. That's the DNA of your father. This is an earthly race. But there's another race, another nation. There's the first Adam produced a physical race. The last Adam produces a spiritual race. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. As we have the DNA of our earthly father, when we're born again and we receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls, at that time we have a new DNA and we do not sin because his seed abides in us. Well, let's take a little closer look at Peter, then a little closer look at the new covenant, and then a little closer look at the scriptures. That's the plan for our morning lesson. Simon Peter, first time he met Jesus, was challenged with the thought 
of being a different kind of a person. You know, Simon, I'm giving you a new name. I see potential in you, Simon. I'm calling you Cephas or Peter, a stone. There was going to be a transformation in your life, Peter. You've been vacillating and headstrong and all that, but I got potential. I got plans for you. And throughout the three years of our Lord's earthly ministry, Jesus was in the process of training him and preparing him for a spiritual kingdom. It's referenced here in 1 Peter chapter 1 where he said he has given us a new birth unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter was reluctant to believe that Jesus had to die and after he died uh, it must have been so depressing for him. He denied him three times and all that and then uh, Jesus is resurrected and said, go tell the disciples and be sure to tell Peter. <laughs> he appeared first to Peter, then to the other apostles. Somehow, Peter was destined to be a leader. Every time in the Gospels that the 12 apostles are mentioned, Peter's mentioned first, Judas Iscariot is mentioned last. Uh, the Lord was in the process of preparing him. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration. And this to me is so significant that Peter was there when Jesus walked on the water, raised Lazarus from the dead, fed 5,000. But when he reflected on the reality of his faith, the one experience that rose to the surface was on the Holy Mount. And I think, uh, you know, if you're trying to prove to somebody that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, how would you do that? Especially if the person was illiterate, didn't even have a written language. There are millions of people like that around the world. But what happened on the Holy Mount was Jesus went through a metamorphosis. He looked like this, and all of a sudden, God changed him. And that's happening today in the South Pacific, in Africa, Asia, all over the world. People are like this, and God changes them. And they shine like lights in a darkened world, and they let their light so shine. And... Uh, illiterate people can see the transformation of somebody's life. I've talked to a missionary in Thailand and he said, you know, uh, you can, uh, a lot of these people can't read and write and so forth, but when the head man of the village who had been smoking opium and beating his wife is transformed by the power of the gospel, he said, people notice that. Amen. And so Peter said, <laughs> We are not following cunningly devised fables when we may know you the power and coming of our Lord. We were eyewitnesses of him. We were there in the Holy Mount. We heard the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him and you would do well to take heed unto the prophetic word like a light shining in a dark place till the, till the day dawns and the day star arises in your heart. We use the expression, it dawned on me, it dawned on me. The theologians call it an epiphany. Epi means upon and final means to shine. All of a sudden the light came on and I saw it for the very first time. And this is relevant to Peter because by the Sea of Galilee, he confessed Jesus three times and he was feeling the heat, you know, and, uh, Lord, what about him? Pointed to John. He said, none of your business about him. If I will that he tarry till I come, that's none of your business. You follow me. When you were young, Peter, you put on your clothes and did what you wanted to do. But when you get old, somebody else is going to address you and tell you to do something that you don't want to do. And this... Jesus said, signifying by what manner of death Peter would glorify God. And this, the day was drawing near. Peter had said earlier, Lord, we've left everything. What are we going to get? Oh, man, you're going to get plenty on this earth. Hundreds of times, mothers, fathers, sisters, family, with persecutions. And in the world to come, you're going to get eternal life. So Peter said, so I will always remind you of these things even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. And I think it right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent, the tent of this body, 
because I knew, I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every after to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So the day was drawing near. Peter's getting excited because there was an eternal kingdom and he was going to receive a reward. You know that this is not an option. If you come to God, you must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You've got to believe that. That's not an option. Amen. And so coming to the renewal, saying your prayers, doing the good things, uh, one of these days, well done, thou good and faithful servant. <laughs> You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you a ruler over many things. Now, let's take a deeper look at the new covenant. There's an old joke they tell on the Kansas woman. They took her to the ocean. She said, what'd you think of it? She said, I just thought it'd be bigger than that. <laughs> of course, 25,000 miles around the earth at the equator and because of the curvature of the earth, you can only see a little bit. The ocean is 35,000 feet deep at the Marianas Trench. This is an interesting bit of trivia, but in the 104th Psalm, there were mountains before the flood. In fact, the Bible says the ark, uh, the waters prevailed over the mountains 15 cubits, which means that the ark could safely float over Mount Everest or any other mountain. Uh, there's plenty of room and not scrape bottom. But apparently the mountains became higher and the crevices deeper after the flood. Read the 104th Psalm and that, that's implied there. So we have the highest mountains, Mount Everest, and we have the lowest place on the ocean, the Marianas Trench, associated with one another. And as God, as the waters were receding and as God was forming mountains to new heights and crevices to new depths, we have the highest and the lowest associated with one another. And so here's this woman saying, man, I thought it'd be bigger than that. And it's 35,000 feet deep and there are millions of creatures in the ocean. I know Lynn Gardner in his, uh, why should we believe, uh, he talks about the archer fish, which is a little bitty fish that somehow has the capacity to shoot a projectile of water six to nine feet outside uh, above the level of the water and shoot down spiders and insects and so forth off of tree limbs. Now there's a certain refraction so that you put a stick into the water and it seems to bend because the, the water changes the opti optics. And so somebody, evolutionists were trying to figure out how on earth did this creature do that? So some Italian scientists came up with the answer and they said, this is a team of scientists from Milan University. Research by a team from the University of Milan shows that the fish's forceful strike is formed externally using water dynamics rather than using the body's internal muscles. Well, thank you. <laughs> that makes it clear, you know, it's... Uh, 50 years ago, they had these elephant jokes going around and say, uh, how do you get five elephants in a Volkswagen? Simple. You put three in the back, two in the front. Next question, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> how did you find it so quickly, you guys from Milan University? And you know, all of a sudden, oh, man, you just, uh, now, why, we'll, we'll make blueprints and have one of those creatures done in an hour or two, you know, with that kind of specificity. So uh, I want us to take a deeper look at this thing we call the new birth. Uh, Charles Darwin believed that life came from non-living things. And there was a German scholar by the name of Ernst Haeckel 
who uh, agreed. You know, he got his microscope out and looked at the mud. Oh, yeah, he said, out of this non-living mud will come a simple cell. That's the way they described the first living. Oh, it was a simple thing. So today we have better microscopes and we find out that this simple cell, let me quote, the technology of the 20th century, of course we're in the 21st, the technology of the 20th century has delved into the tiniest particles of life and has revealed that the cell is the most complex system mankind has ever confronted. Today, we know that that cell contains a power station producing energy to be used by the cell. It contains factories manufacturing enzymes and hormones essential for life. It contains a data bank where all the necessary information about all products is recorded. It contains complex transportation systems and pipelines for carrying raw materials and products from one place to another. It contains advanced laboratories and refineries for breaking down external raw materials into their usable parts and specializing cell membranes, protein, to control the incoming and outgoing materials. And these constitute only a small part of this incredibly complex system, which we call the simple cell. Somebody said it's more complex than the space shuttle or a 747. And Darwin in it, well, it's a simple cell. Now, this is an earthly thing. This is the disposable. And here in our text, you know, uh, John the Baptist made reference, or this passage in Isaiah 40, all men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. As the grass withers and the flowers fall, uh, well, this is a temporary world. It's going to be rolled up like a scroll. But there, there's coming a better one. The physical one was created in six days and Jesus has been working on this other one for 2,000 years, friend of mine. It's going to be something else when we, when we get to glory. Peter was closer when he wrote these words and he wanted to stir up everybody's mind, uh, pure minds by way of remembrance. And I just kind of want to encourage you to focus your mental and spiritual energies on what he said, we're born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible word of God. Now, focus is interesting to me because you can see everything on this platform at the same time, but you can only focus on one thing at a time. You have a peripheral vision and a focus. I've got an inexpensive watch, and there's probably a dozen pieces of information on this watch. Who manufactured it, the time, the date, that is waterproof to 200 meters and a dozen, you know, light and all that. But I, I can see it all at one time, but I can only focus on one thing at a time. If I'm going to know the date, I don't look at the time and vice versa. So Peter said, gird up your pure minds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we got we to gotta, we gotta think about this. Now we do our best. God is a jealous God. He will not be trivialized. And uh, if you're just nonchalant and lackadaisical, he's not going to reveal anything to you. But real religion is revealed. Uh, the world in its wisdom doesn't know God. Smartest guys on earth, and as Brother Given points out, the angels. If, if just intelligence was all it took to understand the, the mysteries of God, the angels had already found it out. But they didn't know either. So you will search for him and find him if you search for him with your whole heart. And when you become a friend of God, he reveals things to you. Amen. Shall I tell Abraham what I'm going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, I think I will. He's my friend. Yeah. I'm not telling anybody else, but I'm going to tell my friend. Jesus looked at the scholars. And uh, when I went to college, I was told the secret to understanding the scripture is to know Greek and Hebrew. And in my ignorance, I bought that. I really thought that was the case. But the scribes and Pharisees knew Greek and Hebrew better than anybody in our Bible colleges. And I'm not putting down the scholars in our Bible colleges, but seriously, you go to the Greek professor in your favorite college, take him to Athens and have him converse with a five-year-old child, and he's lost. And he's our scholars. At the last renewal, 
Somebody said, what we need to do is to get all the scholars in the Christian church and all the scholars in the acapella churches of Christ together and decide once and for all the meaning of the Greek word solo. Some say it means to sing to the accompaniment of an instrument. Others say, no, you don't have to sing to the, you know. And this is a big debate. And if we got all of our scholars together once and for all, we could decide this question. And cynically, I thought, you know, you add us all together, we're a little over 3 million people. The Greek Orthodox Church claims 400 million and so after we decide the meaning of this Greek word, who's going to tell them? <laughs> well, Jesus bypassed all of this controversy with a new covenant. And uh, there's an old joke about the guy that won a gold medal and he was so proud of it, he had it bronzed. <laughs> and I think that's where we are with reference to the covenants, you know, we come to uh, the new covenant and we turn it into the old covenant. And we read 1 Corinthians like we read Leviticus. And the Lord is crystal clear. The new covenant is not written with ink. Amen. It isn't. Amen. And it's not on paper or stone. It's in your mind and in your hearts. We are not conformed by the old way by pressure from without. We are transformed by a new concept, the transformation, the metamorphosis from within. B.F. Skinner in 1938 used for the first time the concept of operate conditioning and he had rats in what he called a Skinner box. And uh, he would starve one group of rats and he'd put them in this Skinner box and there would be a lever and as they ran around this box they would uh, bump into the lever and every time they bumped into the lever uh, food would come into that little box. And so these guys connected the dots and these rats, would every time they got hungry they'd hit that lever. Put another group of rats into another box and this box had an electrical current that was very painful. And as a rat was running around that box and hit the lever, the electricity stopped and there was comfort. And every time they turned on the electricity, the rat would learn to go and bump that lever and relieve the pain. So this came to be known as operant conditioning with a positive and negative approach to it. Well, uh, the Lord tried this. He knew what the outcome would be, but he had to show us. It took us 1,500 years, and we, some of us still haven't learned it. But Deuteronomy chapter 28 took the people out to the mountains and said, Now, here's a mount of blessing, mount of cursing, and you do what God commands you to do, you'll be blessed. You do what God tells you not to do, you're going to be cursed. And there's a big disparity. There's only 15 verses of blessings and I think 57 verses of curses. And so you talk about a big hammer. Boy, they're going to straighten people up now. Man alive, this nation is going to be a holy nation. They're going to be a kingdom of priests. Then in Deuteronomy 32, or is it 31? Let me get the exact verse because this is something that we need to just focus on. We're talking about being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible. It's Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 25 and following. He gave this command, uh, this command to the Levites who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Take the book of the law and place it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a writ, as a witness against you for I know how rebellious and stiff necked you are if you have been rebellious against the Lord while I am still alive and with you how much more will you rebel after I die now brothers and sisters we're talking about operant conditioning and it seems to work better with animals than with people 
over in Revelation chapter 16, they, there were seven vials, and these vials represented plagues. And in uh, Revelation 16, 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify Him. Now, a rat had more sense than that. Verse 10, The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they refused to repent of all that they had done. So the difference between an animal and you and me is that animals don't have spirits. Animals are not created in the image of God. We are. So an animal has a physical body and physical life, and we have spirit, soul, and body, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. We're three things. And the law, the operant conditioning, the Skinner boxes do not deal with the spirit. But the new birth does. We have a spiritual seed and that seed must be planted in man's spirit. And that transforms us from the works of the flesh to the fruit of the spirit. It's an ingenious revolutionary concept no eye had seen, no ear had heard, never entered the heart of man. God was going to do this, but God has revealed it to us. We do our best to study, but the real message comes when God reveals it to us. Jesus said regarding the scholars, Lord, I'm thankful you hid it from those scholars, the wise and prudent, and these fishermen over here, like Peter. You revealed it to him. And I'm praying that God will reveal that to you and to me. When you were conceived in the womb of your mother, there were 23 chromosomes from your daddy and 23 chromosomes from your mama, 15,000 genes from your daddy and 15,000 genes from your mama. These combined to produce you. It's called a zygote, a microscopic form of life. And everything about you was there from day one. Color of your eyes, shape of your ears, how tall you'd be, color of your skin, the fact, well... The human brain contains 100 billion neurons, each of which is linked to 10,000 other neurons. That was in the blueprint. Your eye is an interrelated system of 40 subsystems. The retina of the eye has 137 million rod-like cells that handle black and white, 7 million cone that allow you to see in color. The eye, the optic nerve, and the visual cortex are able to capture, deliver, and interpret 1.5 million pulse messages a millisecond. That's in the blueprint. The ear... Some think it's the most complex sensory system in the human body. It's able to process minute waves of sound pressure from air molecules banging against the eardrums into the neutral uh, neural signals and that are sent to the brain and interpreted as sound. And you can sit in a circle and have somebody close their eyes and somebody in the circle clap their hands and the person with his eyes closed knows which direction the sound came from because there's just that much differential between the way this ear hears it and this ear hears it and we just focus on that. That's in the blueprint. And this is an earthly thing. Jesus said, I've told you of earthly things and you don't believe. How are you going to believe when I tell you of heavenly things? When I tell you about Jesus coming and dwelling in your heart by faith and producing in you fruit that will bear fruit unto eternal life. The human heart beats 70 times a minute, pumps seven tons of blood every day. Circulatory system in our body, 60,000 to 100,000 miles long. Every time your heart beats, your, your arteries expand every time it contracts you. It, so we have a pulse that makes a continual flow of blood to the... That's in the blueprint. The moment you were conceived. Oh, but brothers and sisters... What God is, pre oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And to receive with meekness the engrafted word into your heart and life makes you a new creation. 
Old things are passed away and everything becomes new and nothing you've ever done is going to be held against you because there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And what the law could not do in that it was weak to the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Romans 7, it's not the old way of the written code, it's the new way. And we're born again. <laughs> not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, even the word of God that lives and abides forever. Now, I've almost gone to seed like Cato the elder. This guy was a Roman senator and he believed that the city of Carthage in North Africa needed to be destroyed. And every speech he gave on the Roman Senate, he concluded by saying, and by the way, gentlemen, Carthage must be destroyed. He did that every time he spoke. He died, but three years later, they went down there and destroyed Carthage. Now, uh, in 1963, I became aware through the late Carl Ketcher side that the Old Covenant is not the first 39 books of the Bible. The New Covenant is not the last 27 books of the Bible and has revolutionized my thinking and I've been pondering this since, all, since that time. I haven't got it all figured out yet, but I'm in a, like Cato the Elder, I, every time I speak and teach and write something, I just want people to know that the New Covenant is not written with ink. It's, it's, it's in your DNA. It's a part of the spiritual seed, the uncorrupt. We're not redeemed with corruptible seed, but with the incorruptible, even the word of God that lives and abides forever. Heaven and earth will pass away. This won't. And the Bible, the word of God is not just paper and ink. You burn this. You can't destroy the word of God because the words that Jesus speaks are spirit. You can't shoot them down or burn them. They're eternal. They'll last forever. Flesh and blood doesn't. Like, like the grass, we wither, but we don't in the spirit. Outwardly, we perish. Inwardly, we're renewed every day. And we don't focus on what we see, but what we don't see. For the things that we see are temporal. And the things that we do not see are eternal. So Peter said, Therefore... Rid yourselves of malice, guile, envy, and evil speaking, and like a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be that you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. So I really believe the scriptures, and they're eternal. They, they, they last forever, but they're not the covenant. And yet they're profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. I want to focus on Bible study by reminding you that every time Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, he quoted scripture. It is written, it is written, it is written. First time when the devil said, hey, you're hungry and here's these stones that kind of look like loaves of bread. Why don't you, if you're the son of God, change them into bread? Jesus said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, that's the verse that Jesus quoted let me read it to you from Deuteronomy. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So we have several significant things in this one verse. Number one, he humbled you. They were so cocky and proud, came out of Egypt with a high hand and an outstretched arm. Then three days without food and water kind of changes your perspective. He humbled you. Then he caused you to hunger. If a baby doesn't have an appetite, you've got a problem. It'll die. Normal thing for a baby is to crave milk. Normal thing for a believer is to crave something to eat. Now, there's an illusion that when bread came down from heaven, it was like a welfare check. Just, hey, Martha, go out there in the mailbox. I'm hungry. Get, get that welfare check. Get that manna, whatever. But that's not the way you got manna. They were in a camp, 603,550 fighting men, plus women and children, old folks, young folks. There were several million people there. And everybody ate manna. Came down from heaven. 
but you didn't get it at your front yard. You had to go outside the camp and probably would go beyond where the sheep and the oxen were grazing. I would, to gather manna. <laughs> and a little bitty stuff like coriander seed, and you had to get a couple of liters of an omer. You had to get an omer every day. And it was miraculous in that old people like me that may not get a... Uh, there was just a, a brief time, you know, after the dew left and before the sun wax taught, that was the only time you could gather manna. And some of us old arthritic people, we may not get our full amount. Some of the young people got too much, but somehow God leveled the field so that those who gathered too much didn't have too much. Those who didn't get enough didn't. Everybody got enough, but everybody had to get his own manna. You couldn't hire somebody. All right, we're going to get us a preacher. And he's going to go out there and gather the manna for us. We're going to stay home and entertain ourselves. You know, no, 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 no. And he humbled you. He caused you to hunger. And he fed you with manna to teach you that man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the Bereans were more noble than those of Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily. Well, Gutenberg wouldn't invent the movable type printing press for over a thousand years. People of Berea didn't have Bibles in their homes. Ever. Someone said the average American family has six Bibles in their home, and I don't doubt that. I've got more than that in my home. And I can study the Bible at midnight anytime I want. And we've got computer programs with all versions of the Bible and people with their iPads and all that. Man, it's easy. For, it wasn't easy for the Bereans. They had to get out of their home, go to the synagogue, get somebody to open up the chest, get the scrolls out. They didn't have chapters and verses, but they wanted every day. Paul would teach them something. Every day they'd say, well, is that in the Bible? Is that so? And they'd go get the scrolls and read them. And they, found, and they were more noble. And brothers and sisters, and I, I'm preaching to the choir because I know you guys are diligent students of Scripture, but what a shame that we got a generation of people who claim to believe in Jesus and have no hunger for the spiritual word. None. Something wrong with this picture. North Korea is number one in the world on the persecution of Christians. There are 200,000 political prisoners in North Korea. One prisoner was released, came to America in 2002, testified before Congress that in the five years they were in a North Korean prison, there were 6,000 people who died. They were either executed or died of starvation and disease in a five-year period of time. We now have one man, the only one we know of, who was born in a North Korean prison and escaped to tell about it. His name, Shin Dong-yuk. And a former Washington Post journalist named Blaine Hardin has written a book about this boy titled Escape from Camp 14. Now, in a North Korean prison, there are no real families, and the guards have no morals, and so in order to help people to not be rebellious, they allow men and women to cohabitate for maybe one or two days a year, not often. So Shin's mother and father, it was an arranged marriage, he was conceived, born inside a North Korean prison. They have almost nothing to eat there. Every day they had a little portion of cabbage and a gruel, and if they found rats and insects, they would put them in there to try and get some nurse. Everybody starving in a North Korean prison. This boy was a slave laborer in a sewing, in a 
garment factory and he broke a sewing machine and they cut off the middle finger of his right hand to teach him never to do that again. And rather than complaining, he was thankful they didn't kill him because sometimes they killed people for a mistake like that. When he was 14 years old, he heard his mother and brother planning to escape, so he turned them in, expecting to be rewarded. They tortured him for four days, assuming that he knew about other people who were to escape. When his mother and brother were executed, he had to watch their execution, but he didn't care. He didn't love his mother, didn't love, didn't love anybody. He was in a North Korean prison. That's the only world he knew. Didn't use money. Had no freedom. And then a man by the name of Park, who was 40 years old, was arrested and placed in the prison and he and Shin became friends. And he told Shin something that just boggled his mind. Something that this teenage boy could not conceive of. He said, Shin, out there there's another world and you can eat all you want to out there. What? Eat all you want to? Yes. There's food out there to spare. He said, I want to escape. So it was on January the 2nd, 2005, that these two were assigned to gather firewood near the camp's electric fence on top of a 1,200 foot mountain. And when the guards were out of sight, Park said, let's go for it. He tried first to go through the wires and was instantly killed. But his body grounded the electrical circuit and Shin escaped over the dead body of his friend. He was, his legs were severely burned, but he escaped. He found in a nearby barn an old military uniform and he dressed up and pretended to be a soldier and headed north toward the Chinese border. He stole cigarettes and food and somehow made it to the border and bribed the guards to get across. Never used money, never seen money because he, his world was Camp 14. Today he's a national hero. He lives in South Korea. A German documentary on Camp 14 by Mark Weiss was released in 2012. And this boy says, you know, I'm still in the process of developing from being an animal. That's all I was in Camp 14. Didn't love my own mother. Just an animal. But there was another world and he found it. And he got out of Camp 14 because a friend died to make a way for him. Oh, brothers, this is it. The world passes away in the lust thereof. I mean, we're in a corrupt, evil men are waxing worse and worse. You know that's true. But there's another world. And we can escape because Jesus died to make it possible.